32 years ago today, back in 1991, Ukraine issued a declaration of independence from the Soviet Union. But as we know, today Ukraine is fighting to be free of Russian attacks and occupation. Nick Schifrin has the story. In a country at war, independence is not celebrated, but commemorated. President Volodymyr Zelensky and his wife Olena gave thanks to all those killed in the country's existential war. And they sang the national anthem, its title, Ukraine Has Not Yet Perished, a dark but determined call to one day celebrate a new independence. Ukrainian children on Ukrainian squares and streets will celebrate the independence of Ukraine. The only parade today, prizes of war. Residents of Kyiv walk through lines of burned out Russian vehicles. But still the war grinds on. Ukrainian soldiers evacuated residents from a newly recaptured town in Ukraine's south. Robotine was obliterated by Russian occupation and the Ukrainian counteroffensive. Now the blue and yellow fly atop what used to be a school. Ukraine also says soldiers landed in Russian-occupied Crimea. It's a direct challenge to Russian control in President Vladimir Putin's most prized Ukrainian territory. Today in Moscow, Putin praised the legacy of Yevgeny Prigozhin, the one-time Kremlin soldier turned traitor, who died yesterday in a plane crash the U.S. believes was likely intentional. I would want to note that these people made a significant contribution to our common cause of fighting the neo-Nazi regime in Ukraine. That fighting has caused Ukrainians unimaginable loss. In the western city of Lviv today, Ukrainians walk through a cemetery that continues to grow. Evgenia Demchuk carried her son to his father's grave. Ihor was a combat medic killed three weeks ago. They moved here to this city from central Ukraine to be close to him. We lived for each other. I have no right to leave him here. That's why we raised defenders. Our boys, I now have to take care of him by myself. Today he turns two years old. Dad was very proud of him. He called him his little independence. The U.S. estimates that Ukrainian fatalities and wounded since last February's full-scale invasion to be as high as 150,000, not to mention the millions of Ukrainian civilians who've been displaced, wounded, and killed. For more, we turn to Oksana Markarova, the Ukrainian ambassador to the U.S. Ambassador, thank you very much. Welcome back. Thank you for having hour. me. Um, let's start with the counteroffensive. And some U.S. officials to me and to other reporters have been blunt. They have been concerned about some Ukrainian military strategic decisions. These U.S. officials worried that Ukraine is putting too many soldiers in the east rather than the south. Too many Western weapons were going to the east rather than the south, which is the front of this counteroffensive. What's your response to those concerns? Well, first of all, we have big trust in our military commanders. I think since the start of this full-faced uh, war, they have shown that uh, they are very capable, they know what they are doing. We have been able to liberate more than 50 percent of what Russia has taken since uh, February 24th. And frankly, uh, I've never heard in the conversations with the officials uh, any criticism. We all understood from the very beginning that it's going to be a very difficult summer campaign. Uh, we knew that the enemy is well prepared. We also know that enemy uh, Russians do not do ha have disregard for any uh, human life. You know, you have seen what they have done with Robotino, what they have done with Marienka. They simply destroy everything. These, these are towns that Ukraine has now moved into yes. as part of the counteroffensive. Yes, but, uh, you know, when our defenders are liberating them, they're trying to be very careful because they are liberating our people. So we knew it's going to be difficult. We knew it's going to uh, take all we have. And it still will require many more uh, capabilities and more weapons. But we didn't lose anything since the summer campaign started. And we keep moving forward. There are some intelligence estimates that fear Ukraine will not reach one of its main goals, Melitopol, in the south. Uh, what's your response to that skepticism, that doubt that is inside the US government? We have one goal, to liberate all Ukraine. And we will reach that goal. Now, how much time, weapons, uh, energy it will take, that's, of course, you know, nobody knows that. Uh, but, you know, I've been recently in Kiev, spoke with uh, all our commanders. Uh, 
they know it's difficult, but they also are very optimistic. And now with all the new packages that we hear from the U.S. and other allies, hopefully with more longer distance, uh, we are very eager to longer train. Weapons. Yes, we are very eager to train on uh, uh, all the new capabilities and F-16s. All of that will help us to liberate Ukraine faster. Uh, the U.S. announced today that uh, Ukrainian pilots will be training in the U.S. Uh, for F-16s, yet the U.S. still does not send some of the weapons that Ukraine is asking for, some long-range weapons known as ATACMS. Does Ukraine have a plan if it doesn't or if it can't reseize all the territory you hope for? Uh, well, you know, we have, again, one strategic goal to liberate all Ukraine. We have our peace formula plan which President Zelensky is very actively not only discussing with the leaders, but also uh, we have a number of subgroups on the 10 steps, which have been discussed right now. And again, you know, we have, we're focused on the goal and uh, we're positive that if we are all united and if we do it together, we can reach it. And actually we have to reach it, not for the sake of Ukraine, but for the sake of all of us who believe in the same principles. The Biden administration uses the term as long as it takes, uh, but on that united aspect of this, there are some doubters uh, within the Republicans who are just now, as of last night, debating uh, in the Republican primary. Uh, and let me show you uh, one of the quotes from um, Vivek Ramaswamy, uh, a businessman who's running for president. We are protecting against an invasion across somebody else's border in Ukraine, when we should use those same military resources to prevent the invasion of our own southern border here in the United States. Are you fearful that someone like him or, or someone who feels that way could become president of the U.S. and reduce support to Ukraine? Well, you know, it's, it's an internal matter of the U.S. who will become the president. And, of course, as a democracy, Ukraine welcomes the democratic process and uh, it's up to the American people who American people will elect. What I will say is uh, I was great, uh, I was glad to hear yesterday when I was watching the debate that uh, almost everyone else understood very clearly that actually supporting Ukraine is in the U.S. national interests. If we want to deter other uh, autocrats, if we want to restore the order, which is the basis, the world order, which is basis for the prosperity for all, of all civilized world as we know it after the World War II, if we want to send a resounding message that democracies not only can defend themselves but help each other, and if we want to contain this war, to defeat Russia while it's still in Ukraine, and not to involve other NATO members, and Putin has been very clear that his threat is to everyone else, then it's the right and effective, actually, choice to continue supporting Ukraine so we can win faster. But, yes, you know, Nikki Haley, former U.S. ambassador to the U.N., former Vice President Mike Pence did express their support, the establishment candidates, but the person who wasn't on the stage last night, former President Donald Trump, has also questioned whether he would send aid, as much aid, to Ukraine, uh, and he's by far the front runner. So do you acknowledge that there is some erosion of Ukraine's support among at least part of the Republican Party? Well, you know, the majority of Americans, whether Democrat or Republicans, support Ukraine. We have seen it in all polls. I see it outside when I walk in Washington, D.C., but also when I travel. I just recently traveled to Ohio. Overwhelming support. People understand, and American people are not only very generous people, but also people who are brave and free, as your anthem says. People who believe that when injustice is done somewhere, or as Martin Luther King said, the threat to justice anywhere uh, is a threat to justice everywhere. I feel from the American people that they understand it, and they understand how important it is for all of us to win. Finally, um, we saw in the story that preceded us uh, the reports of Evgeny Prigozhin's death mm -hmm. yesterday and, and the U.S. assessment. President Zelensky today said Ukraine was not behind Prigozhin's death, but, quote, everyone realizes who has a relationship to his death. Who's that? Well, we see war criminals not only attacking Ukraine, but also killing each other on a regular basis. And frankly, everyone in Russia, from President Putin, to all the commanders on the battlefield, whether they are commanders 
and official ministers of defense or uh, thugs like uh, late Prigozhin, they all are war criminals. And when they decide to kill each other, it's their internal issue. But, you know, uh, I think it's again showing how fragile and uh, uh, Russia is and how this aggressive, senseless war that they have started against Ukraine is actually ruining their regime. But does Ukraine believe that Vladimir Putin killed Yevgeny Prigozhin? Well, if uh, when our uh, intelligence will have this information, they will say it. Of course, I will be uh, more than happy to confirm it. But at the, at, this, at, at the moment now, I think nobody knows it for sure. But, uh, you know, we cannot exclude it, of course. Ambassador Oksana Makarova, thank you very much. Thank you.